So we're in week three of our Disconnected series, and we're so serious about it, we disconnected the whole stage and disconnected everything. Um, th- two weeks ago, we saw Hosea and how we can love someone that hurt us emotionally. And then last week, we saw Samson, and we realized that if we are disconnected from God, then all our relationships will be dysfunctional. And this week, we're actually going to look at a very dysfunctional relationship, but we're also going to look at one of the closest relationships in the Bible. And you may have guessed, we're going to talk about David and Saul and Jonathan. And now before we do that, though, we're actually going to start at the end. If you have your hand out, flip it over to the back, and uh, look, there's a list where there's a place to write some names. Uh, During this message, as we talk about this, you might think of some names of people that you might need to give some extra mercy, some extra love, and some extra grace. Just write down their first name on that line if it comes to you during the message. I don't want you to uh, forget um, about those people, so you can just do that and just be intentional about that relationship as we go through today. But back to this story of David and Saul and, and Jonathan. This could be one of those made-for-TV movies. I mean, check out the setting here. So we have this guy who is king, and he's not a good king necessarily. Not terrible, not good. Um, just somewhere in between. And God says, this other guy, this young boy is going to be the king. And the king thinks to himself, there is no way this guy is going to be king because my son is going to be king. He is going to be in charge. This is going to stay in my family as long as I can control it. And so the king wants to kill the boy so that he never becomes the king. But here's the problem. That boy is a good guy. He's a cool dude, man. He's a godly man. People like him. Everything is good. But the king is still wanting to kill him. The problem happens when... The good young man and the king's son become best friends. They are best friends and they care about each other. And the king's son doesn't want his best friend to be killed. 1 Samuel 20, 31 says this. Saul is saying this to uh, Jonathan. He says, as long as the son of Jesse lives on this earth, the son of Jesse is David, neither you nor your kingdom will be established. Now send someone to bring him to me for he must die. He's telling Jonathan, hey, go get David, bring him here, and when he dies, you get to be king. I don't know about you, but being king sounds like a pretty good deal. I mean, you get to tell me what to do, you can eat whatever you want, everything is nice, people do things for you. And he's trying to get Jonathan to rat out David, but Jonathan doesn't do that. I mean, you can see the drama and the tension through this narrative of David and Saul. I mean, you can see the relational issues that would happen here. Let me lay some foundation for you. So David goes to Saul's court, and he's playing his harp. I guess he's a good harp player. He's playing, and he's singing for Saul. And all of a sudden, one day, while he's playing, a spear whizzes by his head. And Saul takes a spear and just chucks it at David and tries to kill him. Well, we see that again in chapter 18 and in 19. It happens again. I don't know about you. After the first one, I'm out. Like, I'm not going to sit around and wait for the spear to not miss the next time. The Bible says... It happened twice, and then it happened in 19. We're not sure if it happened two times or if it happened three times, but more than one is way too many for me. And so Saul is trying to kill David actively. I mean, you want to talk about dysfunction? That is insane. I mean, I wouldn't want to hang around for that. But just because David was living out what God called him to do, Saul tried to kill him. Saul hated him and wanted him dead. Now, here's the thing. David never asked for this. David never asked for this to happen. Saul hates David, and it's not David's fault. David is doing what God has asked him to do, and he finds himself on the bad end. David says this in 1 Samuel 20, verse 1. David fled from Naoth at Ramah and went to Jonathan. He asked him. So he goes to the king's son. He says this. What have I done? What is my crime? How have I wronged your father that he is trying to kill me? Now, maybe you've asked that, not about somebody trying to kill you, but maybe you've asked, why doesn't this person like me? Why do they hate me? What have I done for this person to dislike me so much in my life? I haven't done anything to them. And just like David, sometimes we don't do anything, and yet the relationship falls apart because of the other person's choices. And I'm hoping it isn't as serious as Saul and David. And if you are in a relationship 
that is abusive, then you need to get out and get help. That's not something you should stay in. But more commonly, we have relationships that are dysfunctional, and we don't even know what we did to the other person. We don't know why they hate us or don't like us, and it can be nothing that we can control like David. I mean, the reality is not everyone will be happy with you fulfilling God's call in your life. Somebody might just not like you. They may take offense to you simply because of what you believe. They may have some narrative in their head about who you are. When I went to a junior high, I had a teacher, and my four older brothers had gone through this school, and they're about 10 years older than me, and they're rough, to put it mildly, all right? And so when I got there and they saw my last name, the teacher's first question was, are you related to? And I go, yeah, and then she just shakes her head. She had a narrative in her head of who I was, and it just wasn't true. Maybe somebody has a narrative about you that just isn't true. But maybe they've heard something, or you've done something, and they took it the wrong way. Or maybe they just don't like your face. I don't know. There's a lot of reasons people might not like you. I don't know what it is. There's a million reasons for them to hate us. But our reaction is the only thing that we can control. Our reaction is all that we can control. We see throughout David's life how he reacted to such hatred. And it shows us why he was called a man after God's own heart. Because of how he reacted to hatred. And there are many lessons we can learn from David, <clears throat> Saul, and Jonathan. And the first is this. We will have to deal with difficult relationships that are not our fault. We'll have to deal with difficult relationships that are not our fault. Now again, obviously I'm not talking about an abusive one. Like I said, get out and get help. But I'm talking about relationships that are difficult and it's not because of your doing. And maybe they don't like you. Maybe they don't like what you stand for. Maybe they're jealous of you. Whatever it happens to be. Or maybe they are just people that you find hard to deal with. Everyone has different personalities so they can handle things differently. At our house, here's the deal. I don't handle whining very well. Like when my kids whine, I, I can't take it. Like that is my, but quit your whining for Pete's sake. So when they whine, I send them to my wife. <laughs> but here's the thing. My wife doesn't handle the anger very well. My boys get angry. They're boys. And so when they get angry, they come see me. I can handle the anger part. But all of us have something different that will test us in different ways. Different things really just kind of push our, our buttons. And some relationships may be tough and not because of us. So how do we deal with that? Here's what I do. One of the ways that I deal with people like this is I think through ahead of time that this individual is an EGR. Let me tell you what EGR means. It means extra grace required. When I said that, you all thought of someone. Everybody thought of that person in their life, or several maybe, that are E-G-R. You know, you know what I'm talking about. It's people who when you get around them, you just think to yourself. You put your hat on, you're putting your, I am doing this for the Lord hat on. That's why you're able to deal with them, and you're working with them and helping them, because you put that on, because they may be difficult. They may be mean. They may just be angry, or they may be just super needy people. I don't know what they are, but when I know in my mind that they are EGR ahead of time, it lets me be a better grace giver. I'm ready for whatever interactions that might happen. And it isn't wrong to understand that we struggle with certain people. We are going to struggle with certain people. It may be a personality clash. They may not like us, or they just may be unhealthy emotionally, and that unhealth causes dysfunction in all their relationships like we talked about last week. But knowing you will need patience ahead of time helps prepare us when we do. I love sports and I, and I coach a lot. And sometimes I tell my boys, this is going to be a really hard practice. Like really, really hard. Think of the hardest practice you've ever had and multiply that by two. That's what we're fixing to do. And then we have our hard practice. And you know what they say afterwards most of the time because I've told them that ahead of time? At the end, they go, it wasn't that bad. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't that tough. Because in their head, they had already imagined how bad it possibly could be. And so when we got done, they thought, it, it wasn't too bad. And as, as dealing with people that I think, man, that person is tough. And when I think to myself, they need extra grace required ahead of time. And, and I begin to think that through ahead of time. By the end of the interaction, it's usually I'm thinking to myself, that wasn't too bad. 
That wasn't so bad for me dealing with that individual. And sometimes my opinion of that person changes. And it begins to grow as well. Because in all actuality, we've actually only given a small bit of grace that we've been shown. We're actually not really even giving extra grace. We're just giving a small bit of grace of what we've actually been shown by God. Another way that uh, we give extra grace and mercy is by choosing to show unconditional love. We talked about that a few weeks ago in the context of someone that hurt us emotionally. But what about someone who continually doesn't like you and are continually mean to you? How do we show unconditional love to them? Now first, I don't want you to mistake unconditional love with unconditional obedience. Our society seems to have traded off this idea of love is equal to you do what I want you to do. And that's just not true. Or this idea that love means you agree with everything that I say or do. That's not what it means either. But God has called us to give unconditional love. And unconditional love means that we treat them with kindness. We treat them with respect. We want what is best for them according to God. I mean, David loved Saul unconditionally, but David didn't walk out there and let him kill him. Unconditional love is not unconditional obedience, but we give unconditional love we care about their well-being and we do what we can to show them jesus in us i'm gonna tell you a personal story so i've got somebody i'm very close with a um, very close relative and uh, that person has just made some bad choices like bad life choices that i just i don't agree with their lifestyle don't agree with the direction that they're going or anything like that and we're not super close as far as communication but i got an email the other day and that person, and I know they had to be in dire straits, they asked if they could borrow some money from me because they had some job issues and they needed some rent money. And I saw this and I thought to myself, they must really be hard up if they're asking me because they, I, they know that I don't agree with these things. And I had some options here. But they asked for an amount of money that I didn't have. I wasn't able to, to do that. And I thought about what should I do? I don't agree with their life. I don't agree with what they're doing. But what should I do? And I prayed about it and I thought about it. And I decided that I would give them what I could, not loan it, give them what I could for them to help them pay their rent. Now, I don't know what will come out of that. I don't know what might happen because of that. But despite their choices and disagree with them, I wanted to show them love. And I'm not saying you have to give money to someone just because they ask. But what I'm saying is showing love in some form, despite disagreement or past problems or even current issues, is what it means to be a person after God's own heart. Now, the love, that love can be exactly what brings that person back into relationship, and that love can be exactly what brings that person to Jesus, which is the most important part. You see, when dealing with EGR or problem people, we always have to start there with love. How can we show them love? How can I do something different than other people? Let me tell you about this person. So, after this happened, this person used to refer to Christians as, as hateful people, and they've changed their tune since then. And I don't know if it's going to go any farther than that. But I do know that because I showed them love, their mindset has changed a little bit. Their attitude has changed a little bit, and I hope that we can begin to have a conversation through that. You see, we show love and again, when dealing with this, we kind of start where David started. In 1 Samuel 20, verse 1, it says, What have I done to cause this? Maybe you've said that before. Why is this relationship broken? What have I done to cause this? That's the first place we begin to look to heal relationships. And here's the tr truth. Sometimes the answer is you haven't done anything. You've literally done nothing. But it doesn't give us complete freedom as a Christian. It doesn't give us complete complete freedom like we are innocent because we are still obligated by a different law. James 4, 17 says this. If anyone then knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. Here's what he's saying. Basically, as Christians, we may not have caused the mess, but because we serve God, we clean up the mess. That's what he says here. We are responsible for cleaning it up. So for those of you who have little ones, I want you to think back. And I want you to think back to that time that your baby had their first major diaper blowout. I want to tell you about mine. So Eli was about one years old, and that's the day that parenting got real. We went to a church picnic, and a buddy of mine was with me, and Eli's in the back, and he starts to cry. And we pull in, and I look back there, and something blew up. 
And it, I, I don't even know how physics works, evidently, because it is all over the car seat, the seat next to him. I'm like, you're only yay big. What? There couldn't have been that much. But evidently there was. So I began to clean it up, and I'll be honest, I, I, that was our first kid, and I wasn't prepared. I just was not prepared. We used everything we could find. I, in the back of my trunk, there was a vinyl sign that we had used, like one of those flexible ones. That's what I used to clean the mess up with, because I had nothing else with me. We had no extra clothes, but I did have one diaper. So we changed, and we were at this all-church picnic, thousand people, and so I get him all finally cleaned up as much as I can, and he's in a diaper. That's it, no clothes. In a stroller, walking around, looking like the poor homeless pastor's kid. <laughs> like, what is wrong with you? And I'll never forget that day ever, because I was traumatized. But I'll never forget that. But here's the deal. I didn't make the mess, but because of the role I agreed to, I was responsible to clean up the mess. And as Christians, it's the same with us. We may not have made the mess, but as Christians, we are in the role of cleaning up the mess. Now, I'll be honest, you don't have to clean up messes. You just have to choose not to be a Christian. But I hope that you do choose Jesus, and I hope that you do choose to be a Christian. And when you do, you are saying, I will be responsible for cleaning up some messy relationships that aren't my problem. I didn't cause that. I really didn't cause that in the car, trust me. It was Eli. But because of my role, I had to clean it up. And that's what he's telling us here in James 4, 17. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them, even when it isn't our mess. We clean it up. And the only way that we can do that is if we do what Romans says. And he says, love our enemies, Romans 12, 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. We talked about loving people who hurt you emotionally a few weeks ago, but what about loving your enemies? Not just someone who annoys you or is making bad choices, but like an arch enemy. Every time I think of arch enemies, I always think of comic books. I'm a big comic book person. You know, Batman has the Joker. Superman, you know, has Lex Luthor. Captain America has Red Skull. Thor has Loki. I could go on all day. I'm a big comic book geek. And so I always think of this. These aren't just people who don't like you. These are people who are literally trying to do something bad to you. How do we love somebody like that? How can you love someone who wants to hurt you at every turn? Well, the place to go for guidance is God's word. And I, I'm going to look at the man who has the moniker, a man after God's own heart. Let's see what he did. Now, I want you to remember, remember Dave, Saul is chasing David all over the countryside. David's got his little band of merry men, and they're running around, and they're hiding from Saul as he's coming to get him. And David and his men go into a cave. And they're hiding in the back of this cave. And the Bible tells us, of all the caves around, that Saul chose this one to go relieve himself. Yes, some more potty humor, but this is in the Bible. And so Saul goes in to relieve himself in this cave. And David's men are in the back, and they're thinking to themselves, God, you are good. You just delivered us our enemy. We're going to finish this. David's king. We don't have to hide anymore and live on scraps. We get to go live in the castle. And so David sneaks up on Saul. And he says, no, we're not going to kill him. So Saul's in there, and evidently he's in there for a while. And he sneaks up on Saul, and he cuts off a corner of Saul's robe. And he goes back to his men. And he goes, and the Bible even says David was stricken in his conscience because he cut off the corner of his robe. And so David didn't kill Saul when he had the opportunity. So what, what does David do? What does David do when he's being upright and righteous? We're going to look at what he didn't do first. He didn't repay evil for evil. He even stopped his men from killing Saul. David could have just walked up to him and poof, war's over. The men could have just killed him. The war is over. Not only did David not get revenge... For this person trying to kill him, he didn't let his posse do it either. He didn't let his people go and get him. So let's talk about what that means for us today. What does that look like for me today? That means this. You don't talk bad about the person that doesn't like you. But not only do you not talk bad about them, you don't let your friends do it either. You don't let your friends mistreat that person either. You see, that's a little different. It's easier for us to go, oh, I didn't do anything. No, but your friends were jerks to them. Your friends did that to them. Again, we know the good we ought to do and don't do it. We are saying that's what it means today. Don't let somebody else attack them. You say, no, we love our enemies. 
I mean, that's what he is talking about here. You stop them from getting revenge. That is leading by a godly example. Every time I hear this story, I think of the word meek. Maybe you've heard the word meek before. Jesus says the meek will inherit the earth. Uh, Meek doesn't mean weak. Meek means you've chosen to submit. That's the difference here. And when we are Christians, we have chosen to submit. And there's nothing more powerful than somebody who chooses to submit because you can choose not to submit at any time. And meek does not mean weak. And yet David is meek because he's choosing to submit to God. He is choosing to submit to what God wants him to do. Jesus was meek as well, and he chose to submit. And as Christians, we choose to submit by loving people who hate us who don't like us, who talk bad about us. We choose to be meek. But the reality is, when you choose to be meek, you're actually very powerful. It's easy to get revenge. If somebody punches you, what's your natural reaction? Hit them back. Somebody says something mean to you, the first thing you're thinking of is, uh, I'm rubber your glue. You know, whatever it is you can think of. You want to say something right back to them. That is our natural reaction. You want to be strong? Show love. Show grace, show mercy. But here's what David did do. He took the high road. I mean, that's a common phrase because it's easy to be mean. But that is why when we choose not to retaliate, it stands out so much. That's why when we choose love, grace, and mercy, it is so different from the world because the world says get even. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But when we show love, grace, and mercy, it is different. If you don't hear anything else today, I want you to hear this. If our relationship with Jesus doesn't lead us to go against our natural desires, then our relationship is not that strong. If our relationship with Jesus does not lead us to go against our natural desires, then our relationship is not that strong. If my natural desire is to get even and that's what I do, I need to reevaluate my relationship with Jesus. If my natural desire is to be mean because they were mean to me, I need to reevaluate my relationship with Jesus. If I react like everyone else that doesn't know Jesus, then maybe I don't know Jesus. See, that's the difference between Christians and non-Christians is we show love, we show mercy, we show grace to the people who hate us. Jesus would give mercy to the unmerciful, grace to the undeserving, and love to those that hated him. And for us to call ourselves Christians, our relationships have to look like Christ. And part of dealing with difficult relationships is God making us like him, making us holy. You see, God is developing our character when we deal with enemies in his way. David has a second chance to kill Saul. So Saul is out in his camp. Evidently, David's like a ninja. He just sneaks up on people all over the place, and he walks right into the middle of camp while everybody is sleeping. Nobody sees him. And Saul is laying there on the ground, and David's there with Abishai, and and Saul's spear is right there. And Abishai says, hey, let me just pin him to the ground. That doesn't mean like wrestling. It means take the spear and just stab it right through him, and this is over. David says, no, that's not what we're, we're going to do. He says, we're not going to do that. But David takes his his spear and and they leave. And he says this to Abishai. He says, don't destroy him. Who can lay a hand on the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? David had an opportunity to end this war. David had an opportunity to get even. He had another chance to kill him. He would have been king, but he knew the ends didn't justify the means. It was not his job to get revenge. You see, David was more concerned about being guiltless than being right or being vindicated. He was more concerned about being guiltless, being right or being vindicated. That's the hard things to do. We all want to be vindicated when something happens to us. When somebody talks bad about us, we want to go, no, they did this. If somebody does something mean to us, we want to get back. If something is done, we want to make it right. But what is more important to God is us being guiltless than, not, than being vindicated. Here's a question to ask yourself. It's in the bulletin. It's going to be on the screen. Is this. Am I more concerned with being vindicated or with being guiltless? Which one's more important to me? Do I want to prove I'm right? Do I want to get them back? Which is more important? I have a really good friend. He went through a really tough divorce. Really tough divorce. And while they were going through this divorce, his ex would talk bad about him all the time. Everything he did, just all these things, stuff made up. And so people began to believe the stories that she told because she was the first one that would say something. He didn't say anything. He didn't talk bad about her. He didn't trash her. He didn't even try to defend the stories that were told about him. And I just couldn't believe that he would do that. And we talked through this whole thing, and he, he knew. He said, you know what? I cannot do that. I would rather be guiltless than be vindicated. 
And for me, it was the hardest thing in the world to not correct those stories. I wanted to say, well, you're just getting one side, and that's not exactly how it all worked out. And, and that's not exactly how it is, but it wasn't my story to tell. And so we heard all the time all these things, and we realized that his character was growing through this. His character grew because he chose to be guiltless rather than vindicated. And by the end, and not that it matters, people began to realize the truth. They began to realize just because you heard something first doesn't mean that is exactly the story and what happened. And his character began to shine through, through this. It was very impressive. And I don't know that I could have done it because I would have wanted to be vindicated. Maybe you would have as well. But eventually choosing to do right is always the right choice, no matter how hard it is in the moment. No matter how hard it is. You see, character is built in tough situations, and character is worth way more than simple revenge or feeling, care, or feeling vindicated. We also see this blessing from God, though, when we live this way. We've already seen that the meek will inherit the earth, but there's more. God will bless us when we show mercy. God will bless us when we show mercy. And it may not be as obvious as material blessings, but our character and our reputation are worth far more than material wealth. When you say, I will do something, and people know that you will do it, man, that's worth a lot. That is worth a lot. Your character and who you are is worth way more than material wealth. Luke 32 through 36 is this. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be, a ch- be children of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Have you ever read the Bible and you thought to yourself, I wish that wasn't in there? If you haven't read something you wish wasn't in there, you probably need to read it more. Because you read something like this, you read something like this, and you think to yourself, that first part's fine, but wait a second. They hate me. Kind to the ungrateful and the wicked, and I have to love. And this is some pretty big expectations for us. But here's what he's, Jesus, God is saying. Here's what Jesus is saying this. He is saying, who are you? Who is in charge of you? And the delineation is, how do you treat people who are mean to you? If you're only nice to the people that are nice to you, that's not what a Christian is different. A Christian's not different. Everybody does that. If you lend to the people you think you're going to repay, that's what non-Christians do. How are Christians different than non-Christians? Because we love people who hate us and are not nice to us. And when we do that, we are imitating God. We are imitating God. When we are kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. And that is how people know whose we are. That we are God's children. That we are set apart. One telltale thing about Christians is, the Bible says they will know us by our love. They'll know us by our love, how we love one another. If you notice that most hospitals have a saint in front of their name or a religious, Christian religious background, because Christianity cares about people. Many other religions think, well, God did this to them or whatever, but Christianity cares about people. Have you noticed that um, when there are needs that Christians give, it's statistically proven that Christians give more generously than anybody else because we care about people. Have you noticed that when people are tied into a church and they have a church family, that when a need arises, they are taken care of better because we care about people. John 13, 35 says this, By this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And we see this amazing example of love throughout this story. We see the example of what it means to show mercy in a difficult situation. David does that for Saul. But I'll be honest, here's the most amazing part of this whole thing is Jonathan. (laughs) Jonathan is often forgotten in the Bible, and he gets these footnotes with David. He gets these footnotes with Saul. But Jonathan was a great man that we forget. He knew God's call for David, and he supported it. He could have easily killed David and been king to be king. That's a big temptation. That's like winning the lottery, all right? That's what it is here. He could have killed David and been king. He could have killed Saul and made David king. He could have done that. And what's the most amazing thing about Jonathan is this. It is his ability to live justly in the midst of uncertainty and trouble. He lived justly in the midst of uncertainty and trouble. He showed love to both deserved it and those that clearly didn't. He was God's disciple. When people talk about you, do they say that person is clearly God's disciple? 
That person is clearly a disciple of Jesus. Well, that can be the narrative of your life. That's how your life can be. And here's how. Show mercy to the unmerciful. Show love to the unlovable and give grace to the undeserving. You see, for us to claim the title of Christian, we have to live like David and Jonathan. And that means we live justly in the midst of uncertainty and trouble. Now you might be thinking to yourself, these sermons all kind of sound the same these last couple of weeks. I mean, they keep talking about us loving people that don't like us, people that hurt us, or how do we get healthy in our relationships so that we don't have dysfunction. But here's, here's the reality of it. As Christians, if we can love and show mercy and show grace, people's lives will be changed. It is maybe not just the life of the person that you're having the issue with, but somebody else will see that and they'll say to them, say, how can you be nice to that person that is so mean to you day in and day out? And you say, well, I can't do it, it's Jesus. Jesus does it through me. It's the Holy Spirit in my life. That's the only way I can do it. And that person might have eternity in heaven because we have chosen to be merciful like God has called us to be merciful. Because when we live this out, then we are showing that we are disciples. I mean, John 13 tells us why. Because we are seen and we are known by our love. And I hope that while I was speaking today, you thought of somebody to write down. And you thought, you know what? I need to show them more grace. I need to love them better. I need to give them some mercy. But it's also possible that you realize while we were talking that you need grace in your life. That you need to be forgiven for the things that you've done. And that you need God's mercy and love as well. And if you've not made that choice to receive God's mercy first, you can do that today. You can choose to be a forgiven, loved child of God. And then you can take that mercy and spread it to others as well. And to make that decision, we call that getting on base with God. Now let me tell you what that means. The B is to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. The A is to admit that I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. And the S is to surrender and say, God, you're in charge. I take your forgiveness and your mercy and grace, and then I will spread that to people that honestly just don't deserve it. But because I'm your disciple, that's what I'll do. And E is to express that in Christian baptism. And you can do that today, and you can have grace. You can have mercy, and you can have love. And if you've already made that decision, then here's our homework for this week. And you probably already guessed it. But it's to show mercy, grace, and love to someone that you may have written down. Now, if you didn't write down a name, then be intentional this week about giving mercy to someone you feel attacked, has attacked you at work. There's people at work that take your ideas and pretend they're theirs. There's people at, at work that, uh, that maybe have, have done something that, or took something you did and pretend like it was what they did. Or maybe they're just mean to you. I don't have any idea. Or maybe it's somebody in the community that you, that you deal with. Every time I think of this, I, I'm a big Seinfeld fan. He always sees Newman. He goes, Newman. Who is that person in your life that you're thinking, oh, I just, I just can't be around them. They don't like me and I don't like them. And how do we show them grace, love, and mercy? You see, since we have chosen to follow Jesus, then we want everyone to know that we are his disciple. And the best way to show that is to give mercy to the unmerciful. It's to love those that hate us. And here's the thing. Loving those that hate us is the best litmus test on whether you are actually a Christian or not. Can you love someone who hates you? And that is the best test for any of us. And my prayer is this, that all of us will pass that test with flying colors because that will make a difference in our community, in our relationships. Let's pray.